<laughs> They're recording. Okay, cool. <laughs> Hi, everyone. This is Jay from Interview Query. Today, I'm doing a mock interview with Scott. Scott is a machine learning engineer and data engineer at Nextdoor. Uh, welcome to the mock interview, Scott. Hey, oh, I thought this was a real interview. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It will be. Right. If you, if you I guess we could. Well. <laughs> I guess we could just we could do this too. I guess. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so before we start, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about yourself and how you got into tech, engineering, data, all of that. Yeah. So um, let's see here. I mean, I got into tech because I was obsessed with computers when I was in high school, and I thought I was good at them. I really wasn't, but. Um, I kept being interested in it, in it. Mm -hmm. so I um, ended up taking computer science for my undergraduate. Um, it wasn't until like my first internship where I realized that this shit is really boring. <laughs> that I started reading, or like at least the stuff that I was doing was really boring. Mm -hmm. I started reading a lot more software engineering literature um, and actually got a lot deeper into um, I guess the trade um, than I had initially thought I was going to be. Um, and I think, I think that's kind of like why I'm here. Um, okay. Because I, I still think it's a very interesting um, way to build out things that are useful for people. Yeah. Um, how I ended up in data is I've always been kind of a database nerd, I guess, or how, how I store data um efficiently i think there's been a lot of interesting problems surrounding that um and i i don't know i just kept digging into those kind of roles so my first role out of uh my undergraduate degree was working at aws in storage mm -hmm. um when i was working at a startup i liked the projects where I got to build out our own data warehouse. And yeah. then when I applied to Nextdoor, I found my, most of my interest being um, around how to efficiently transform data into being something that could be searched and uh, transformed very efficiently. So I think that's like largely the journey that I've been through so far. Awesome, yeah, and I think that uh, is good because I've asked a lot of people this question and they all have different answers based on how they feel about um, how they eventually got to their current moment, right? And their current experience level. Uh, and it's definitely super interesting. And I think yours is no different. Um, cool, so let's start out with the first question. Um, and this is like more of a data engineering question from Amazon, but uh, let's say that you have a table with a billion rows, right? Uh, and let's say that we want to add a column to this uh, table, uh, but we want to do so without any sort of downtime. Can you lay out like uh, the scenario and how you'd actually perform that? Um, well, before, yeah, I mean, before we dive into the question, I guess I have a few questions for you. Um, okay. What kind of database is it? Uh, what kind of database is it? Let's say it's a uh, Postgres database. A Postgres database. Yeah. Okay. So, with if we if we don't want to incur any downtime, um, I guess my question to you is. Uh, what impact would downtime have? Um, good question. So downtime would be bad because let's say this is um, uh, Amazon, like e-commerce site, right? And so if we're down for like 10 seconds, that's probably like a million dollars in sales or something. Okay, so okay, like- So then it's, our, it's, it's in our best interest to uh, keep uptime because uptime is worth a million dollars. So exactly. being able to backfill all of those records with zero downtime um, 
just isn't really doable. So I would, I would actually do this in phases. Um, okay. And it also depends on like, it, can we have like a default value uh, attached to, uh, so Postgres allows you to have default values without actually writing the uh, actual column value into the record. Okay. So we can use that as leverage. Um, then we don't even have to really backfill. We just have to apply our uh, table, uh, our table definition change, and then we're good to go. Um, okay. So let's say it's not Postgres, and then it's like MySQL or something. So if we don't have that at all, yeah, like, we don't. Oh, have that. you just want to say we don't have like a default value. We don't have the default value. Um. So I would do this in phases. I think it makes sense to um, lock out chunks of records and update those values. But let's initially just have them. Um, or actually, let me, let me think about this a little bit. How many records get added to the table um, per second? Per second. So uh, let's say if there's a billion rows, then um, let's say that uh, there gets like a million rows added per day. And then let's say like, if we extrapolate from that, like probably like, uh like a couple like a thousand records per second that's probably not right but let's just say a thousand records per second okay yeah um so one way to kind of do this is to create a table that is identical to the other table but with an extra record and have all new records right to that new table um and then we'll slowly start copying uh data from that old table okay. to the new table um, with whatever default value that we want to give uh, that table. Um, and when we're reading from that table, we have to read from both tables for the short, for the short term. Okay. Um, eventually, after all of the old records uh, are copied over to the new table, we can drop the old table and uh, move on with our lives. And then we have, um, uh, we effectively have our new column with no downtime. All right, cool. I wanna ask you uh, retro. So what did you think about the questions that were asked? What did you think about the interview? Um, I think the, questions that were asked were intentionally left vague. Mm -hmm. So I definitely have to probe um, and get a better understanding of like where our constraints live. Yep. So that I could give a good-ish answer. I mean, a lot of my answers were still kind of hand wavy uh, if we're being quite honest. Um, but I think like, I think High level, I hit them okay. I hope so. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it was, uh, do you think in terms of like um, difficulty level and like how much you have to probe, is it more on, uh, so I guess on my side, I think like a lot of the time, I think it's like on the candidate for a lot of interviews because they're faced with uh, a lot of variability in their interviewers uh, because many can be more leading while some will be like less so, right? And so if you stop asking questions, then potentially they may, uh, you know, just move on to the next one and assume the worst, which is that you didn't know anything, even though you probably did know it. 
And so um, do you think that there's like, what do you think about like the amount that you have to like basically dig in versus like almost answer and, and like kind of have a conversational back and forth? Right. Um, that, that one's hard to answer actually. Um, yeah. I, I tend to play it by ear. So I think if you ask too many questions, then you're not doing any thinking or any discovery on your own. Yeah. Which doesn't bode well in debriefs. Um, yeah. So it's good to have some ideas, uh, talk out loud on those uh, kind of ideas, and uh, even just ask for feedback on what the interviewer thinks of like your idea. Yep. Yep. Um, and I think that's good. I think, I think if you list, you also need to listen to the interviewer and pick up on any sort of hints that uh, they may give you. So when you said, uh, do things letter by letter, immediately clicked in my head, that was a hint. Yeah. <laughs> and if I pick up on that hint, then the interviewer knows that I picked up on the hint and can probably think, or I think the interviewer will think like, okay, this person probably knows yeah. it, what's going on here and what I was thinking in terms of structure. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. 